Yavapai Broadcasting and the City of Cottonwood proudly present Inside Cottonwood, an inside look at the decisions and issues of the City of Cottonwood. Brought to you by Arizona Smile Designers. Hello, welcome to Inside Cottonwood. I'm Diane Jones, Mayor of Cottonwood and your host today. I'm excited about our guest today. We have Vincent Randall with us. He's an Apache elder, historian, and also manager of the Apache Cultural Resource Center. And then we have Chris Coder with us right here. Chris has worked for the Yavapai Apache Nation for many years, as I understand it, and he's their archaeologist. So gentlemen, we want to start out today to talk a little bit about you. And we'll start with um, Mr. Randall. And let's talk about your, let's see, I guess you, you grew up in Clarkdale and yes. you attended college at NAU. So yes. let's share with us a little bit about that. Okay, I, uh, uh, I was born in Clarkdale. I still live in the same property uh, that where I was born. In the Apache culture, they say that your your umbilical cord uh, that's left is buried there. So my umbilical cord is buried on the property that I live. Uh, when my family came back from San Carlos uh, back in the early 1900s, they moved around to where they had originally come from, but they um, the uh, people that moved into where they had lived and the Forest Service had taken over the properties in 1905, so they became, they came down into the Verde Valley to be with their clan relatives, the Yako Gayan, which are the white land people. And I belong to the Yoane, which means over the rim on top of the pine country. And that's where my original families people came from and uh, so they moved into Clarkdale uh, my mother used to say in 1911 mm -hmm. and uh, down to the piece of property that I still live on and my bedroom's about 30 yards from where I was born. Oh, that's an amazing story. Yeah. There aren't too many people who can say that. <laughs> so you really have some roots here, right here in the Verde Valley and right in Clarkdale. Yes. And uh, you, you taught school in Clarkdale, as I understand it. Yeah, I taught in, in the Clarkdale school system uh, for 28 years. That's a long uh, time. After I graduated, I waited from uh, NAU back in 1963. It was Arizona State College. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I had a job opening. Uh, Mr. Uh, Robert DeVault, who was the principal, who had been my teacher and principal of the school, always told me that, you know, you, you can always come home. So after I graduated, before I graduated, I did my, did my student teaching in the school system, and then uh, it just happened that uh, the uh, math and science teacher uh, left and went to Kingman and the job opened up, so I, he gave me the job, and i been there other than I did a couple of years off for graduate work, but I've always taught in the system for 28 mm -hmm. years. And you also, as I understand it, coached. Tell us a little bit about that. You had, you were, had some accolades as a coach. <laughs> well, I uh, coached boys basketball all those years, uh, won five state championships with uh, junior high division. And then I also coached at Mingus Union High School in, in the girl, as a girls basketball coach. I coached uh, a, a year of freshman basketball and then two years as a JV coach and then as an assistant varsity coach with uh, Coach Ryder. And we went to the Final Four uh, back uh, uh, I think it was 2008, 2009, and, um, but I basically followed my daughter. I coached my daughter 
Uh, the reason why I got into coaching girls basketball was my wife told me that. She said to me one day, she said, you know, you devoted over 30-some years coaching boys basketball, mm -hmm. and your daughter's now playing basketball. I think it's about time you coach your daughter. Oh. <laughs> so, I tried, which I never regretted. I really enjoyed coaching the girls basketball. I had a, a lot of fun, and, and uh, we really... So basically the team that went all the way to the final four in the 4A division was the girls from Clarkdale that I had coached. Well, that's an amazing story. Yeah. You just, you've been everywhere, huh? Yeah. I suppose with 28 years under your belt for teaching that you might have even taught some of the children of people that you taught originally. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was getting to where uh, my, as I started teaching school, that uh, eventually their children started coming through. And uh, in fact, I coached one of your neighbor, uh, 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 Michelle, uh, the Silversmiths. Oh, uh, you, yes, your Michelle. Michelle. Yeah, Michelle. Yes, yeah. that's the, a great family. Yeah. Yeah, the Silversmiths, yeah. great neighbors. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Chris. Um, I grew up in a small town in western Illinois, right on the Mississippi River, and I have a degree in geology from Augustana College in Illinois, and I moved to Flagstaff in 1980 to go to graduate school, and uh, that was a very premeditated move because I wanted to be close to the Grand Canyon. I had been on a couple geology field trips um, in college to Flagstaff and fell in love with the canyon. and. Um, ended up getting a master's degree in anthropology just uh, for no other reason than um, I could be in Flagstaff. And uh, ended up being a professional archaeologist kind of by accident. Um, uh, and that worked out very well because I spent my career on the Colorado Plateau, Colorado, Utah, the Southern Plains, and I worked for several years in the Grand Canyon as a river corridor archaeologist. And uh, when my wife and I started having babies being on the river 250 days a year wasn't such a great plan and mm -hmm. uh, I fortuitously just kind of also by um, blind luck went to work for the nation the year after they opened their casino and I've worked with Mr. Randall um, all those years on cultural preservation issues and and the reason the tribe has an archaeologist which is probably uh, not commonly known why a tribe would have one it's because all tribal lands of federally recognized tribes in the United States are still considered federal land. Mm -hmm. So tribal lands have to be dealt with by federal land law, and federal land law says that any um, development or project done on federal land has to be cleared by an archaeologist first so something important from the past isn't destroyed or, mm -hmm. or uh, put at risk. And so it's easier for the nation to have an archaeologist on staff than um, trying to find one for every project that comes along. So once the casino went in and the money started to flow for projects and practical construction and baseball diamonds and uh, elders facilities and that, that whole uh, program, um, they just found that it was more practical for them to have me on staff than try to find somebody for each little project that came up. And it's, it's been a nice fit all these years. And that's Yeah, that's a lot of years with the Avapai Apache Nation. Okay, well, thank you very much for, for um, sharing with us a little bit about your history. Right now, it's already time to take a little break. So we'll, we'll break here and we'll be right back.
everybody. I am Lou Ann Patterson. My family and I would like to welcome you to the Copper Star Indoor Shooting Range, Northern Arizona's premier shooting sports facility. We offer a 25-yard pistol range, a 50-yard archery range, and Arizona's only 100-yard indoor rifle range. In addition, we have a full-line gun shop as well as an archery pro shop. Come check us out. We're located at Highway 260 and Cherry Road, right next to Out of Africa. Looking forward to seeing you all. Welcome back to Inside Cottonwood. I'm Diane Jones, your host. We're going to have two episodes of speaking with Mr. Randall and Mr. Coder because there's so much to talk about, we didn't think we could fit it into just a half hour episode. So this is the first episode. It'll be running on cable, um, on channel two of, on cable TV and also for people that don't have cable, they can watch it on verdevalleytv.com on the internet. And it will also be uploaded to YouTube. So anybody can, can watch the shows in that manner if they don't have cable TV. Hmm. Again, we were talking about your backgrounds and your college and where you've grown up and those sorts of things. What I really wanted to talk about today was to talk about some of the history of the Yavapai Apache Nation people. And Mr. Randall is, is Apache and he um, is going to share a little bit with us about where the um, Apache Apache peoples kind of originated, and as I understand it, um, the tra traditional, we'll talk a little bit about Yavapai, it's two distinct tribes, but um, it originally, and we do have a map here today, stretched from the San Francisco peaks in the north to the Pinal Mountains in the east and to the confluence of the Gila and Colorado rivers in the southwest. And the, the picture we have up there right now is of the Rio Verde. And I think we're looking for uh, another photo right now. Um, so it ran to the Colorado River in the southwest. So talk about, I mean, the, the origination as far back as you, as you know to the Apache tribe at least and where, where, they, where they lived, where your ancestors lived. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that um, when you talk to the elders and, uh, and, uh, especially in the Verde Valley, the Yavapai and the Apache people have lived together. And, um, it's kind of, uh, they don't talk both so in years. Uh, uh, I remember when I was, a, when I was a kid, I asked, uh, some of my elders, my, grandpas and grandmas, how long have we lived with the Yavapais? And this is the way they used to say it. We live with, uh, we call them goon in Apache. We live with the goons for a long time, <laughs> is the way they used to talk. Mm -hmm. So we was living together for a long time, and we're a matrilineal society. There were intermarriages, but uh, being a matrilineal society, you follow your family line through your mother's side. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the American society, it's patrilineal. You carry your father's name down the line. Correct. And uh, so even though there were mixed marriages, there are always your allegiance, first allegiance is to your mother's side of the family. So if there were cross marriages, if you had a Yavapai mother, you'd be a Yavapai person first, but you're also, in Apache, we say you're given as a gift to your father's people. So if it was an Apache, then you were given to the Apache people, or vice versa. Apache mother, be Apache allegiance first, and born uh, for the Yavapai people. So there were uh, mixed marriages, so we have common stories together, uh, especially those uh, Yavapais that lived in the Verde Valley. But uh, stories that the Apaches tell is that they came and lived with us because they wanted us to be, they said that, the elders used to say that they said that 
they were uh, being always in constantly in warfare or being raided by the either the Pimas or Maricopas or even the Wallapais and so forth. So, and they said they don't seem to bother you people. So we'd like to live with you, and so they came to live with us. So we share a lot of common stories. So one of the stories that we share is that uh, we uh, emerge from the, the first world through Montezuma Well. And the Yavafais tell a story about how they emerged from Montezuma Well, so do we as Apache. And our name for Montezuma Wells is, uh, is uh, split water. That's uh, uh, to uh, and uh, and we emerge from there, and then we continue our stories, and go through the second world, which is after the flood, and then we have a story about a hero that we call the killer of enemies, that uh, killed the monsters of this land. To keep to make our people safe. So, in our stories, we've always been here. We didn't migrate here. We came from the underworld through Montezuma Wells. We lived through the flood. A, a woman lived through the flood that gave birth to a new generation of Apaches. And the Yavapais tell the same story, similar, not mm -hmm. the same, but similar, about how they also began to repopulate the land. So and do so, both do both tribes feel that they were born from Montezuma Well, or is that mainly Apache? They both have the same story. Oh, oh wow, At that's At least the, the Alpais in this part of the country, they mm -hmm. both have the same story. Mm -hmm. Similar story, I shouldn't say same, similar mm -hmm. story. And they also have the same uh, hero. We call him Nayetnes, one A in Apache, that means killer of enemies. And they call it Skata Umcha in, in uh, Yavapai about how he sanctified the land. And so we have very close ties to basically the, uh, this land, um, especially with the Red Rocks. A lot of our stories about, about the land being sanctified. And so we have a very close tie to this part of the country, and that's why after being incarcerated in San Carlos for 25 years, they wanted to come home. It's kind of like uh, similar to the Jewish story about how they were dispersed. And then in 1948, when the United Nations recreated Israel, the country of Israel, the Jews started coming home, and they're still coming home today. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the same. We have that same affinity to the land, because the Jews, as they, as, um, as they were given the land of promise, uh, God gave them that land, sanctified that land for them. We have the same similarity to affinity to the land that's here, and that's why we're here. And, and that's I, why we'll always be here. Absolutely, and I can kind of relate a little bit. I grew up in Sierra Vista and moved as a teenager, and in my heart, that's always my home. You know, the mountains, the lands, it's, yeah. you know, the San Pedro River, it's just kind of where your heart is and where your roots are, so I totally understand that. Yeah. We'll be right back, we're going to take another quick break, and we'll be right back to talk a little bit more about the Yavapai Apache Nation and its history. Having a fire escape plan is very important to keep your family safe and together in the event of a fire. When you awake to the sound of a smoke detector and smoke in your room, don't stand straight up. Carefully roll off your bed and stay low under the smoke. 
If your door is shut, feel the door with the back of your hand. Slowly open the door if no heat is felt. Always stay low until you get to the outside of your home. Always have two ways out of your house and a specified meeting place somewhere outside your home. Home escape plans should be drawn up and rehearsed on a regular basis. This could be the difference between life and death if caught in a fire. Welcome back to Inside Cottonwood. This is the first of two episodes about the Yavapai Apache Nation and its history. And we have today with us Vincent Randall and Chris Coder. And we've just really been enjoying our visit about the history of, of the, especially the Apache Nation since um, Mr. Randall comes from the Apache tribe. But we're going to talk a little bit, bit about language, um, the differences between the, the Apache and the Yavapai language. Can you share a little bit about that? Uh, yes, the, uh, the, uh, the Apache uh, language is, uh, belongs to what they call the Athabascan uh, family of languages. And the Athabascan language, of course, is Apache and also our our cousins, the Navajos, they speak uh, the same kind of a dialect. Um, Navajos and Apaches can more or less understand, mm. uh, not actually word for word, mm -hmm. but they can, the they general the, idea is, okay. is, is, is the similarity in languages is there. Whereas in the, the Yavapai is totally different. They belong to the, their language is what they call a human st language. Uh, and which mostly is spoken uh, in Arizona would be in, along the Colorado River, starting okay. with the Sioux Pies, the Wallapies, the Mojaves, Cocopas, and down, to, down the uh, Colorado River, they speak the human dialect. And uh, it's kind of the same way. What a Yavapai speaker can understand a little bit of what, mostly the real close similarity is the Wallapies and Sioux Pies. The, the Yavapais can pretty well understand each other mm -hmm. with those family, and then on down the line, they can also understand a little bit of, of each other. And, but the uh, difference between Apache and, and Yavapai is just like Chinese and French. Mm -hmm. That's uh, quite a difference. Uh, well, a real big difference. <laughs> right. And of course, language is, to me, is the basis of your cultural identity. Mm -hmm. If you know, uh, if you know your your uh, mother language, uh, it's a total concept of your cultural life because all of the things that you feel, reflect, and communicate is through the language that you, is, uh, that you speak. Absolutely, and that's how you retell your history and keep your history going. Now, did the history, was it written through the years or has it always been verbal and told through the generations? It's always been an oral, uh, both languages have always been oral. The Apache language really hasn't, uh, there was some primary work by the Lutherans, by uh, the Uplagers in San Carlos, and there was another guy named Hoyer that uh, came out west and uh, and Grenville Goodwin, some of those guys, but they never really put in the uh, written language per se until about 1964, the Wycliffe Bible Society came to the White Mountains and uh, set up the language, written language is phonetically based and uh, and it's the, it's accepted. So today we read and write. We can read and write Apache, but before that it was all oral. And of course, being orally oriented, um, your language is really complex. It's very descriptive. It uh, tells you exactly. Uh, we were doing a we're doing a dictionary of our language and our dialect, and the linguistic guy wanted to know how to say he fell. And the elders that were sitting there, we all looked at each other and we said, well, well how, what are you talking about? Uh, because we can say he fell 
Either he got thrust to the ground, he got chipped to the ground, he fell, just kind of fainted. How mm -hmm. do you, you know which which mm -hmm. one do you want? So, <laughs> so there's like three or four a, or five different right, it's, you words. Right, got a real, or... real mm -hmm. distinct, uh, and that's why I always tell people the uh, Indian people when their language is so descriptive, so complex that what you say is exactly what you mean. There's no ifs or buts. You don't read under the lines, below the lines, and I always tell them that's why we didn't have lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's very interesting. Now, as I understand it, you're really working hard to teach your younger, your children, the language, and how, how is that working? I mean, is, it, do, is there a fear that eventually you'll lose your language? Or are you working hard to retain it within your, your nation? It's, it's really hard, I can be honest with you, that the, um, our, there's a couple of things that happened to us uh, that, that uh, made our language, well, first of all, intermarriages between the two groups of people. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, the other one didn't pick up the other one's language, so neither language is spoken in the house where the children are growing up. Mm -hmm. So then the children, then English is a common language right. that they use. So English now becomes a term. Uh, the boarding schools uh, that our parents went to, our grandparents uh, forbade the speaking of our language. So that kind of knocked our language back mm -hmm. because they started speaking nothing but English and mm -hmm. so forth. And then today we have all this modern distraction of different things, whether it be TV, computers, games, computers, phones. it's all English and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then it's getting to a point to where the the elders that speak the language are all now passing on. And uh, so, you know, when we get together, the elders, myself, and I have an advisory panel and so forth. We speak our language. We have fun mm -hmm. talking, but out in the open, nobody's talking. It's, and it's just like, as I told uh, some people, uh, I don't speak very good uh, Spanish, but I do speak Spanish. I understand Spanish more than I can speak it well. But the reason why I picked up the language was I had friends that were Spanish speakers, and I wanted to hear what they had to say. Mm -hmm. He wanted to understand. Uh, yeah, understand what right. they say, so I picked up the pieces, and mm -hmm. so I can understand that. Whereas today, our children don't have that opportunity because they don't hear whether it be be Yavapai or whether it be Apache. It's not commonly spoken, mm -hmm. so the children don't have that curiosity to say, "Well, I want to really want to learn how to." Mm -hmm. So, but it's we're trying. We we try. We have classes, and um, you know, we're trying to to revive the language, just so to say. And probably record some of it so that it's not lost. And oh yeah, and we're like I said, we're working on our own dictionary, which is kind of a working dictionary. It's just not you have a word, you say it, so forth. It's mm -hmm. you have examples of what, mm -hmm. well, how to use it, mm -hmm. and, and so forth. As Mr. Randall mentioned, language is virtually a complete correlation of the culture. Absolutely. So as culture becomes more diffuse, traditional culture and the kids are eating pizza and playing golf and driving cars and playing video games and wearing different clothes, and the old culture gets left behind to an extent, the material culture, baskets, mm -hmm. hunting, making bows, understanding plant medicines, living outside with the seasons, uh, there's no way to describe that. And, and so by default, as Mr. Randall said, English becomes the default language everywhere. Mm -hmm. For Chinese businessmen, German bankers, Absolutely. Apache kids, mm -hmm. Yavapai kids, um, Navajo, kids. Navajo kids, and um, it's it's a real blow to the elder folks because uh, the only incentives now for the kids to learn the language are ideological, not practical, mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and it's a problem and it's sad. But it, it is, it, and and every, life is um, all about change. It seems like and change happens throughout history, and we move forward. 
but I understand wanting to retain those cultural languages and, and all of that. You know, we're, we're at the end of our original or our first episode, and I just want to let the audience know that we're going to come back, we're going to have another episode, and we're going to talk about the Rio Verde Reservation and some other interesting things about the Yavapai Apache Nation <clears throat> and in the Verde Valley. So I would encourage everyone to come back to the second episode. We're going to um, go ahead and, and say goodbye right now, and we will see you very soon.